More and more, the U.S. and China view their relationship in a zero-sum adversarial way, and it's not great for smaller countries. In fact, it's a nightmare. We heard from uh, Singapore Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong at the uh, Shangri-La Dialogue earlier this year. He lamented that as the lines get drawn, everybody asks, "Are you my friend, or are you not my friend?" And that makes it. Really difficult. There are several fault lines: geopolitics, trade, technology. Geopolitically, China looms large over most of Asia, and it has ambitions to dominate the region. And its big geopolitical play is a Belt and Road Initiative. The U.S., on the other hand, lies more in the Pacific, but it says. It remains committed to an open and free Indo-Pacific. Against this backdrop, let's set our conversation. Piyush, I'm going to start with you. For a very long time, the smaller countries have desperately refrained from making a choice between the U.S. and China. Are they getting closer to the time when they have to make that choice? As Linda, the reality is they cannot afford to make a choice. Uh, you cannot do that because, from both capital and trade, uh, these small countries are uh, hiked to the bandwagons of both large economic entities, the West and China. And so, the minute you make a choice, you give up 50% of your capital flows and 50% of your trade flows, and that's not a recipe for economic uh, success. So, I do think the small countries will find it more problematic. But we'll continue have to be nimble, dealing on issues-based and principle-based、uh, political agendas. Now, I reflect on a world which might not only be bipolar, but might actually be multipolar. And I would submit that what、uh, Narendra Modi from India is doing is a really good、um, exemplifier. So, if you only have a J, J A I, that stands for Japan, America, India. Are you familiar with RIC, R I C? That stands for Russia, India, China, and are you familiar with infra? That stands for India, France. So this set of shifting alliances, depending on the issue and depending on、uh, the need of the moment, is I think what most small countries will have to do: find their partners and alliances based on what is relevant and what principles they can adopt. Can't afford to make a choice, but push comes to shove. But it does have to make the choice. Where will, where will Asian nations sway? Well, this is my point. I don't think they will. I think they will be issues-based. So, you know, the notion that people will form a block like the Cold War, I think that's not going to happen. The world is too integrated today. China today has is a major trading partner of 30, 35 countries, which is 40 percent of the world's population, a third of the world's GDP. The old Soviet Union was a fraction of that. It was 10 percent of the world's GDP. Trade and capital flows are so tightly interlinked that I don't think you can really get a barrier in a completely bifurcated world. And therefore, in that backdrop, I think countries will find it、uh, appropriate to continue to play the middle, play the centre. What you said is correct. It will be harder. It will require a lot more deftness and nimbleness. But I think that is the stance they will take. Zero. We know that Africa has been impacted by the U.S.-China trade war. Growth is down. Investor sentiment is down. Commodities, currency, also down. In such scenario, has the U.S. reputation in Africa been impacted, and has China's standing been boosted? Well, I mean, if I just look at the the businesses,、um, the the industries that are operating in Africa and African companies, they're not feeling the trade war in the sense、um, that you are. Uh, in the sense that you're explaining it right now, the truth is, African countries are doing business both with the U.S. and with China. They're buying goods from both places. Commodity prices ebb and flow, right? So there's not any particular difficulty yet that African countries are feeling、uh, vis-a-vis this trade war. But we know that trade wars、um, hurt everybody, right? We know that 30 years ago,、um, now the Berlin Wall fell. Um, and you know we were celebrating that 30 years ago, and here we go again now, 30 years later, with new barriers being erected. What we do know is, as a continent, Africa is not based on ideology. People will pick 
who the better partner is and who is coming up with better deals, better and more deals. And China's been very um, active lately in Africa, so has Russia, right? We've seen all the different summits that have been taking place, interest in Africa um, in ways that we hadn't experienced before, or I guess in, in different forms. And so really, the, just like uh, Piyush just said, I don't know that there's like a choice, like it's either, either or, it's really gonna have to be a mix of both that Africa will have to deal with. Do you, in a way, see China's influence growing in the continent? Because if you take a look at the numbers, China's the only bloc out there versus Europe as well as the U.S. that's continued to invest in the country over the last three years. Well, China has been active in Africa for a long time, right? I, was in, I lived in Gabon a few years back, and, I mean, they have 75-year-old people who have Chinese parents, right? So China has been active in Africa for a long time. Um, there are new commitments, right? Uh, at the last 2018 uh, summit that President Xi hosted the African leaders at in 2018, he announced a $60 billion uh, commitment to Africa. At the same time, announced that the commitment from 2015 had already been delivered. While this is happening, we're seeing new commitments now jumping off from Japan, announcing a $30 billion investment in Africa. The U.S. consolidating a, a new agency that's also looking to invest $60 billion in Africa. So I think we, we, we had the first, let me call it scramble for Africa, back during independence and colonization days. Today, the relationship is different and the partners are different. And China's been there the whole time, but so has, you know, the, the, so have the other partners also. Uh, President Jin Le Kun, the U.S. views the AIIB rather suspiciously. It sees perhaps the AIIB as a rival to U.S.-led institutions. Is the AIIB a competitor? Um, we just had a delegation um, headed by the former ambassador to China, uh, Mr. Gary Locke. And he, he took us, uh, I think, took a team about more than 20 people. We had a very productive discussions with them. And I told him we, uh, in the bank, received the U.S. congressional delegations, businesses, and the conversation, communication between our bank and the U.S. has been going very well. And regardless of membership of the United States, we cooperate. We work with the um, U.S. financial institutions. We have an American nationals working at our bank, taking very important positions. And we also encourage U.S. manufacturers and suppliers to be competing for, for contracts in international competitive bidding. So I think people should not simply be left with the impression that simply because the United States is not a member, we have tense relationship. It's not really true. And from the very beginning, we have had very, very good cooperation with the World Bank and ADB, EBRD. Indeed, I had a very good uh, discussion with the new president, Mr. David Malpars, right after he took over. And recently in Riyadh, uh, Saudi, I had another uh, round of discussions with him, and uh, we we understood each other very, very well, and we are on the same page, promoting sustained development. And we run by the same standards, which is we would make sure the borrowers from our uh, multilateral development banks would be financially sustainable, and the lenders, the multilateral development institutions, should also be financially sustainable themselves. So this is very much important. Secondly, we all pay attention to the environment. And our bank has been ramping up our efforts to promote a green economy, implementing Paris Agreement. And thirdly, of course, we should help the people who might otherwise be adversely affected by the infrastructure development. So we are doing very well, and uh, certainly we will go on working like that. So it is conceivable that the U.S. and China could collaborate and invest in developing countries, in infrastructure development, for instance? I never doubted, I never doubted it. Uh, I think uh, U.S. and China certainly uh, have broad space to work together, improving the well-being of these their pe two peoples, and also to help the rest of the world. Now, over the last couple of years, two years or something, I think probably international attention has been very much consumed by the trade dispute 
between U.S. and China. And we're certainly very happy to see the, the first phase, which is very much promising. So we should look beyond the trade dispute between these two countries. Hopefully, they can work them out. And we need to look at the broad global issues facing us, climate change and uh, imbalance of development among all of the countries. How can we make sure that the globalized economy will bring benefit to the people uh, in each and every country? And how can we also balance the interests of different countries participating in a globalized economy? So there are lots of things we need to pay attention to. Don't just be consumed by the trade dispute. Sergio, Europe has always looked west towards the Pacific, but opportunities are increasingly in the east. What are European companies doing and what's dictating those choices? Is it more political values or is it more hot-nosed business calculations? Well, it, actually, if you look at what happened in the last few years, uh, the interlink in the Euro-Asian dimension has grown uh, dramatically. So I would say that relationships and trade, um, particularly when you look at infrastructure and investments, uh, the balance between uh, U.S., Europe versus uh, East uh, and, uh, and, and, and Europe has, is coming up almost to the same level. So I think that Europe cannot afford really at this stage to pick up uh, a site. So I think that we, we need to continue to develop uh, uh, sound and, uh, and, and uh, um, uh, uh, sustainable uh, uh, relationship with both sides. Um, you know, is we are way too dependent on, on both uh, for growth and uh, and ongoing business. So um, I don't think it has to do with ideology. It has to do also with with business. And uh, and this is very clear that uh, um, you know. I also fundamentally I don't also believe that you we will ever be facing a situation in which any country has to pick up side. Um, you know, uh, China and the U.S. have no interest to create such a dramatic uh, um, um, a break uh, of uh, relationship. It's going to be extremely uh, damaging for both, and therefore it's more tactical than uh, strategic. But it is more challenging. It's challenging, but uh, I wouldn't, I, you know, as I said, I wouldn't see it as a uh, challenge that is going to be a, a determining factor uh, in, uh, you know, in, in, in how we invest uh, uh, in, in East. East is a clearly wealth creation, is a team, uh, and uh, economic growth, uh, there is still a lot of people coming out of poverty, and therefore for European uh, uh, export, for the European export industry is definitely an area where we need to continue to look at uh, how we can uh, take advantage of this opportunity. So, let me, you know, you talked about geopolitics and whether Europe needs to think about politics or economics. Uh, let me make a little bit of a controversial statement. I do think ideologies on both sides are drifting more towards uh, the center. Uh, the West has been driven by liberal capitalistic ideology, but increasingly, the model of uh, unbridled capitalism mm -hmm. is coming under question mm -hmm. because it's not necessarily delivering the best outcomes for the underbelly, the masses. And you can see, therefore, the activism across the world, and you can explain Jeremy Corbyn and Donald Trump and so on. Uh, on the other side, you're increasingly beginning to see a, a greater role of market forces. We've had several force, uh, panels this morning talk about that. So if you take the veneer off and you really look at uh, underlying it's not clear to me that ideological differences will be sharp enough to drive that uh, need to make a choice. So I think most people's choices will be driven by economic considerations and the well-being of their people. And in that environment, I agree with the rest of the panel. I don't think you'll always make fixed choices about being in Camp A or Camp B. I think you'll make pragmatic choices depending on what suits your people and your circumstances at a point in time. With regard to the issue of geopolitics, I think probably we should be careful about uh, invoking this mantra of geopolitics. Whenever there are some issues um, facing a couple of countries or bilateral relationship, because fundamentally we are dealing with economics, and I think we need to uh, observe the fundamentals of economics. Don't try to blow these geopolitical issues out of all proportion. 
that would contaminate the public mind and making sometimes very simple issues very complicated. So we need to work out trade disputes. We need to improve the investment, cross-border investment, helping with all of these countries coming together through investment in infrastructure and other productive sectors. Thereby, we can enjoy the benefit of cooperation. So in my view, cooperation is the key. Don't just hop in on geopolitics on each and every case. But when you talk about trade as well, there's that fine balance between wanting investment, for instance, from China and maintaining your national sovereignty. How do you define that line? So we, um, you know, there's been a lot of um, criticism sometimes of uh, Chinese investments that come with, uh, you know, Chinese labor, Chinese funding, Chinese financing. Um, so in the case of projects that aren't necessarily in the best interest of a country, for instance, then you're, you're stuck with it. Um, recently, um, one of the countries in West Africa canceled an airport project, for instance, just because, you know, they just didn't see how this was in the best interest of um, their people. At the same time, I think the, the Africa has a huge infrastructure gap. That's the, the, the big challenge that we have. We also have a lot of catching up to do when it comes to industrialization and, you know, manufacturing and trading on more equal footing rather than just selling commodities. Mm -hmm. So we, the African continent isn't interested in a particular ideological scenario. We want to be able to trade with everybody. You know, we have our own now um, African Continental Free Trade Agreement that's in effect to increase intra-Africa trade. But all these things mean that cooperating globally is something that we just have to do and that we would like to do. Did you want to say yeah, so just one word. You see, we have members from Africa, North Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. And we are already investing in, in Africa. The first country is Egypt. But then we try to work uh, in Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa, helping them improve uh, their connectivity so that they can move out of the traditional trade pattern, exporting raw materials, importing manufactured goods. This is something, you know, which should not be uh, tolerated anymore. But we would be working with uh, but the World Bank Group. We would be working with African Development Bank and maybe EBRD when it's, you know, uh, expanding into Africa. So I think we can, by working together, right, we can really make a difference. Uh, Sergio, this, this question is for you. I mean, do you see a shift in Europe's global outlook, given that if you take a look at Belt and Road, for instance, it goes to the heart of Europe, to the port in Italy, to the port in Egypt? Well, this is something that, uh, of course, as I mentioned before, uh, uh, is changing a little bit. Um, um, also, the, the entire discussion around infrastructures and uh, the amount of investments that are coming uh, uh, through the Belt and Road initiatives are, are you know, quite transformational. And, uh, and uh, in that sense, uh, I think that is, is welcome because Europe needs a lot of infrastructure and, uh, and, uh, and this is a new team that, as I mentioned before, is going to be very important to really capture uh, the growth. Uh, um, now, maybe going back to the point about, uh, you know, um, uh, some of this uh, aspect of uh, access to markets and, 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 and Chinese firms uh, coming to Europe and investing, I think that, of course, the, the resistance you see uh, both uh, from the private sector and, and, and the political sector is that uh, maybe uh, there is still a lack of 100% uh, reciprocity, I would call it, uh, for uh, um, Western countries, European countries to come to China in certain segments of the market and, and, and being able to do uh, the same. So that's probably more the tension point than it is about having a... Um, uh, ideological um, resistance about Chinese uh, investments. I want to touch quickly on another fault line, which is technology, this whole debate between Huawei or non-Huawei technology. How do you see this playing out, Piyush? Well, it could be complicated. Um, quite clearly, if you wind up in a world with different standards, the Sony Panasonic kind of problems from, for those from my generation, uh, that's not a good place to be. Uh, do you get to use and work with Huawei or not? Uh, but even there, President, I think the possibilities of the, the possibility of that happening 
is actually not uh, as large as people suspect. And one reason for that is that the global standards around technology are fairly well aligned. Uh, if you think about the standards around radio telephony, the 3GPP, the third generation partnership project, uh, which is what defines the standards for most of 5G even, that's chaired by somebody from Huawei. Uh, of the three divisions, Huawei has got vice chairmanship of two. And the Chinese have been actively involved with generating and creating the global 5G standards. So the notion that they will have a standard which is completely removed and different from everybody else in the world uh, is unlikely. There might be shades of uh, uh, difference. Uh, I also think that for the rest of the world, to walk away from some of the technological capabilities that Huawei brings, is the cheapest, is the most advanced, uh, that's not easy. And so as you can see, uh, despite a lot of uh, efforts from different uh, parties, uh, the Germans are still continuing to work uh, and letting 5G work in the, uh, uh, Huawei work in the 5G protocols. And I just saw last week, the New Zealand telco, Spark, also announced that they would continue to work with Huawei. So once again, I think if you really wound up with a splinter net, it wouldn't be good. But I think the chances are remote that you will. And in any event, I think most countries will vote for pragmatic reasons to go with the best providers and the best technologies. And I mean, Huawei is huge in Africa because they are inexpensive and, you know, good quality. technology, good quality. And that's what people buy. People buy the, you know, super quality at a low price is what uh, most African uh, people will buy. So that's why Huawei is doing really well on the continent. It's not an ideological China versus U.S. Uh, uh, consideration. Let, let me, let me. Make an observation. Please hang on, give it funny. Yeah. President Jin looking what other way in this. I'm not talking about Huawei in particular. I'm talking about uh, IT system in general. You know, IT system seems to be kind of myth. You don't know what's going on, even though you can use it, right? But actually, for all its sophistication, complexity, it's very transparent. If somebody wants to put something in it, serving as a kind of spy, you definitely know. So that's why I still believe in high tech, people can cooperate. They can work out a kind of system which is no longer an issue for anybody. So don't, don't think people cannot cooperate just because it's high tech, that's wrong. Middle ground for Europe as well. Well, that's, uh, this is really creating a lot of, uh, of um tensions and debates, I, I do think that uh, we start to see some of uh, uh, what has been discussed before, that at the end of the day, the best, the best technology and the cheapest technology will win, and it's going to be very, very difficult to impose uh, 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 choices around technology based on political uh, uh, agenda. So, uh, you know, in that sense, uh, over time, uh, as a function of maybe the escalation of the of, of, of the tensions between the U.S. and China, those issues are, are going to also come up. And just like that, we're out of time. Zura, <laughs> President Jin Lee-kun, Piyush, Sejo, thank you so much for your time today.